Underdog Fantasy is the fastest growing fantasy app and easiest place to play fantasy sports. Just jump on underdogfantasy.com or download the app, draft your team, and that's it. And if drafts aren't your thing, they also have a pick'em game where you can win 20 times your money in a single night. Use promo code RADIO and Underdog will double your first deposit when you sign up with up to $100 in bonus cash. Deposit $100? Get $100 free. That's promo code RADIO. Terms and conditions apply. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. Back to the basics here on Thursday, June the 2nd, Fantasy NBA Today, the podcast. And I have officially, as of yesterday, I think, lost track of where we're at in number of off-season shows so far. Is this is this 34? No, I can't be right. Well, let's count it up. We'll count it up right here on air. April 11th was our first off-season pod, so week one, two, three, four... Five, six, seven. Oh, more than that. This is off season pod thirty nine. Well, well, well. Good for us. I'm Dan Vespers. Thanks as always for tuning in, everybody. Fantasy NBA Today is a sports ethos presentation. Thank you for all the birthday love yesterday. Much appreciated. Felt nice. I did put out one simple request on Twitter, and that was to get more of you guys to Follow our dang uh, baseball and uh, football feeds. And we're getting there. Little by little, we're getting there. Uh, Getting there. Little by little. I really do. I want you guys checking out our baseball and our football stuff. If you play either of those sports, please do. And I know, like, I'm looking at our football guy, and he's at, like, 160, 170 followers, which is fine. Like, he started at zero a couple weeks ago. But more than 160-some-odd of you listening to this podcast also play fantasy football even if you don't listen to the podcast i would love you to do both but please do at least give jp a follow because he's going to be dropping good stuff on twitter and that takes none of your time to check that out same story with joe like you can already see the cool threads they're putting together i'm gonna keep bugging you guys every damn day this off season because i really don't have any other promos to hit you with today it's the washington wizards We haven't done them yet, right? No, we haven't done them yet. Washington Wizards, who, by all accounts, will have Bradley Beal back next year. They made the big swing at the trade deadline. Really, like, of almost anybody in the NBA. Okay, the Kings, that was a a weird swing. And I call it the big swing? It was a weird swing. But they got them on a Sabonis, traded away prized youth for it. The Wizards took on a bloated salary in Kristaps Porzingis, but they also brought back the best player in that deal. I know Dinwiddie sort of fit what Dallas was doing a little bit better, but I do also kind of wonder, and it's a weird wonder, but what if Porzingis was healthy for a Mavs playoff run this season? Would that have been different at all? You could say it would have been worse, and you might be right. I don't know. I mean, in terms of fit, it doesn't make a lot of sense. He's not just a role man. He's so, uh, too brittle to be a role man, but he does a lot, a lot of other stuff pretty well. I mean, offensively, he's a far better option than anything else the Mavericks had. And you know Dallas is going to be in the market for a big man, but we're not talking about the Mavericks today. We're talking about the Wizards, who made a play to get Bradley Beal to decline, presumably, his player option and sign a fat extension. Now... From what I recall, and I'm not that hyper-piped in on the contractual stuff, but I believe that if Beal goes elsewhere, the most he can make is about $170, $180 million, which, <laughs> good Lord, like, you give me, you, you give me like 5% of that, and I'm set for life with proper investment and whatever. But uh, the other side of things, like, uh, is you're a player, here's what I always think, like, Okay, I, I'm going to circle back to this in a minute, but I do have a, a topical or a topic discussion that I want to touch on, which is what's the difference between 180 million and 250? Because that's basically what Beal is looking at. 70 is the very simple answer to that question. 70 million dollars 
minus taxes and so forth. But for a lot of people, I think they hear those numbers, and myself included, and the initial, the kind of gut reaction is, what difference does it make? Either way, you're set for life. And to that end, you're right. Nobody needs more than $180 million. We don't. From a personal standpoint, we can all take care of ourselves and every single family member we've ever had for $180 million. There's no question. You can take care of all of them quite handsomely for the rest of their lives. But what I think we all forget a little bit is that a lot of these guys, beyond just investments, they want to set things up. They want to have foundations. They want to be able to help communities. They want to be able to give back in a way that, take LeBron, for instance, building schools and scholarship programs in Akron is a big deal. Those are the things that cost an extra 5, 10, 15, 20 million dollars that, you know, these guys don't want to have to be like chipping off at already taking less money. So they go big because, you know, bleep it, the owners can do it. These franchises are all valued at one, two, three, four billion dollars at this point, which let's remember, when you hear 180 million, that's a very small fraction of two billion, and it's all spread out over four or five years, whatever it happens to be. So there is a difference. I hope that most of the folks that make those types of numbers do end up giving a ton of it back to communities and, and bettering the world around them, because for some reason that falls on athletes to do, but you know, they're, they are, in that instance, I think, in that method, kind of heroic. That's the right way to do it. So anyway, back to the actual team stuff. I like, you know, So for Beal, $250 million is a lot more than $180. $70 million over one extra year is a huge, huge number. Fantasy friends, degenerates, whoever you might be, we've told you before that if you look for it every day, it has a cause for celebration. But guess what? Coming up soon, first of all, it's springtime. Holidays, weddings, birthdays, graduations, it's that time of year now. You don't even have to look for a celebration anymore because they're all right there in front of us. So why not celebrate with the gift of beer, wine, spirits, delivered in under 60 minutes with Drizzly? That's right. It's flawless logic. Right now, Drizzly is giving all new customers five bucks off their first order with code SPRING5. Just download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com, D R I Z L Y.com, and use promo code SPRING5 for five bucks off your first order. It is incredible, folks. Incredible fastest under 60 minutes it's the number one app for alcohol delivery sign up now make your first order get five bucks off code spring five that's drizzly.com enjoy Christoph Porzingis is already on the books next year for $34 million. He has a player option the year after that for $36 million that based on the way his body's held up he'll probably take that $36 million option KCP's on the books next year as an expiring contract. Kyle Kuzma, 13 mil next year. Player option, I'm guessing he'll probably decline for the following year, also at 13 mil. Rui Hachimura will be a restricted free agent in two years. Avdia, a few more seasons. Corey Kispert, he was a rookie this year. Daniel Gafford, he signed into eternity with another year and an extension on top of it. So the Wizards actually have a few, what I would call, kind of decent pieces on that team. This all could come apart if Beal decides he doesn't want to come back, but most of the indicators to this point seem to point to him returning to Washington. He's never asked out. They've they really had plenty of opportunities to do stuff with him, and they haven't, and it seems like there is a match there. And it's fine. I think we all question things like that, too. Why would you want to stay and take the extra money? Why would you want to be on a team that's not going anywhere? And... Look, like we can line up the fact that the Wizards do have some slightly better pieces, but they're not a championship team as they're currently constructed. They're probably a play-in team as they're currently constructed. And you know what? Sometimes it's okay to play for an okay team where you've set up your home base 
and make the most money possible. That's okay. It doesn't always have to be about winning the next championship or pairing with your best friend. It can just be, this is my home, I like it here, and someone's going to pay me the most to be in the place I like at home for longer. Cool. By the way, it occurs to me that I should also pause here for a second and point out the fact that you're probably going to hear yelling children in the background because uh, preschool ends today. So, yeah, that's uh, they're happy noises, at least right now. So we'll get used to it. Summertime. It's a different kind of podcast now. <sighs> Lack of professionalism coming into full force here on Fantasy NBA Today, here on June number two. From a fantasy standpoint, some stuff happened in Washington this last year, and you got to sort of sift through it. Number one, Kristaps Porzingis came to town, sat for a while, and then played really well down the stretch for the Wiz. He put up huge fantasy numbers as the primary option, huh, believe it or not, alongside kind of Kyle Kuzma for a little bit in there, but then like a weird blend of KCP and Rui Hachimura were taking shots. But look, when Porzingis was on the floor for the Wizards, he was a his value was kind of near the turn. It was like number between number 11 and number 14 range, late first, early second, maybe sliding more towards the early second, which is really good even by his standards. And this has always been the case with KP. He's going to put up big time per game fantasy stats because he scores, he boards, he hits threes, he gets a ton of blocks. His percentages are generally both pretty good. Very good foul shooter on a pretty high volume. Doesn't turn the ball over. About the only thing he doesn't do all that well is uh, steal. And he even had .7 of those in Washington. Of course, that's also kind of a best-case scenario because presumably Bradley Beal will be around early next year. You know? This is uh, dealing with a left wrist surgery. I don't expect that. We'll sideline him all the way into October from whenever the hell it was. When did he get that taken care of? Like December? January? Was it January? I think it might have been January. That'd be a real long recovery. And it could happen. Crazier things, but... Provided we get word that Beal is starting next season, I also get the feeling that with Porzingis, veteran, Kuzma veteran, KCP veteran, around him, there's going to be a renewed sense of purpose. But there's a lot going on. So let's just go piece by piece. This last year, the Wizards basically had four fantasy-relevant players for the entire season for different reasons. Five if you include Daniel Gafford, and then you had little bursts at the very end of the year. Danny Avdi had like two weeks where he was useful, and Hachimura had about two weeks where he was useful, but we can kind of throw that stuff out. Basically, Porzingis, who was there post-trade, obviously fantasy relevant. Beal, pre-injury, fantasy relevant, but very bad this year. Kuzma was decent all season long for Washington, which was better than I think most of us expected. And then KCP was not that great, but then got thrust into a much bigger role and became pretty good, and it leveled off to, like, king of the streamers kind of zone. He was 107 on the year. Everybody else that I mentioned was above him. And then Daniel Gafford is the one you call sort of the optional checkbox. He was 131 on the season, but he was number 80-some-odd before Thomas Bryant came back. And then actually was decent down the stretch, played alongside Porzingis a little bit. So... There's a question mark there as well. I'm not interested in anybody beyond those guys because I think that's probably, if that's not your starting lineup, then it's Rui is in and Gafford comes off the bench. That's your, that would be the alternative. I don't think they'll bring Kuz off the bench, but I guess that's possible too. He could be the bench guy and then Gafford would get in there and kind of a twin tower sort of deal. Would I draft Daniel Gafford? Meh. No, probably not. I think I'd like to see, and, and, and this really sucks because you're going to have to have your draft really late in draft season to to make this kind of call, but you sort of need to see what, uh, what the starting lineup is on, 
I guess it'd basically be like the last uh, game of the preseason. What's the Wizards' starting lineup on the last game of the preseason? And you can kind of go from there. If Gafford's in the starting lineup or playing decent minutes, uh, okay. And if he's not, then it won't it won't be impacted. But then the the problem with that is, and like. You know, Gafford started their last game of the regular season, but, but Porzingis sat that one out. If we all see that Gafford starts alongside Porzingis, he's going to move up draft boards. Problem is, I don't think it's worth taking a shot on. Even if he does start alongside Porzingis, you're probably still only talking about 22, 23 minutes of ball game because they will go small. KP will play a tall, skinnier center, stretch five, not small, but stretch, Thomas Bryant is off the books, so he's at least not in the mix anymore and, and fighting for those extra center minutes. But a lot of Porzingis' minutes will come at the five. So it's not going to be like 28 Gafford minutes at center, 20 Porzingis center minutes, and then everything else power forward. Not when you've got Rui Hachimura and Kyle Kuzma sort of jamming up the power forward spot. There just isn't room to slide somebody down the board to get more minutes for Gafford. So no, I don't think I would spend a pick on him. If your draft is 15 rounds deep, you could maybe go 15th round. Because he's not going to have a ton of minutes, but at least we know that sometimes he can do stuff in more limited action. KCP, no. He's not going to have the usage to get there, not with Beal back on the floor. Kuzma, I'm actually probably going to pass on him as well. Because I do think that once this team now has Porzingis and Beal together on the floor, they're going to render Kuzma back outside the top 100. Kuz is also not super durable, which would be the argument to say, well, you know, what if Beal misses time or Porzingis will definitely miss time? That argument also, by, by the way, could apply to Daniel Gafford drafters, and maybe we should circle back to that. With Kuz, he missed 16 games this last year, and he does tend to miss time, knee inflammation, things of that sort. It'll probably happen again. And so even if Porzingis and Beal do miss time, Kuzma is going to have to be on the floor for those games does that make up for the Knights when he's now absent? Not really. Not really. So as much as Kuz did have a much better season this year, I don't like his percentages, for one. And I don't like the, the pathway to opportunity that's coming this year. I think I'd probably rather do, go Gafford in the last round than Kuzma where you'd have to take him, which is probably going to be like eighth round next year. He's going to play minutes, so there's an argument there. We've talked about how you've got to have someone who's going to be on the floor, but you also need to have someone who's going to be heavily involved, and he's going to get pushed down the pecking order a lot by a healthy Wizards team starting next year. I'd rather go Gafford in a, you know, maybe in a roto format, games cap, and say, look, I'll just squat on this dude until Porzingis gets hurt, or at least then it also kind of covers your butt. There's a strategy there on the Gafford front that sort of emerged as I was mid-sentence, which is you draft him, not in head-to-head. No point. Take a shot. That's going to be a streaming slot on your roster anyway. In Games Cap Roto, draft him, keep him on your bench for the first game of the regular season. If he starts alongside Porzingis, if you get word eight minutes before tip, you could drop him into your lineup if you want, or you could just see how it goes and then start or not start him in game two, or drop him. If you find out he's not starting, probably drop him. If you find out he's starting, you could bench him still, see how the game goes, and if he only plays 19, 20 minutes, you could probably still drop him. But, in we know it's coming. If he's starting, and he plays like 22 minutes, you could keep him on your bench as kind of a specialist. Or you could start him. Or you could just kind of sit on him and wait until Porzingis gets hurt because you know at that point he's stepping into 25, 26 minutes. So put Gafford in another category on that paper we're always talking about. You guys know the one. Paper we always talk about here on the show. Just got that paper off to the side. We've got the list of the names, players we just kind of want to keep tabs on. This is a way to save a bunch of time later so you don't have to go through every single name on every single team. And I will. I'll do that for you. But this way you're like, okay, these are the guys. I was really curious if they were going to be in a good spot coming out of free agency any trades happening that could impact their value. 
Gafford, he can go in a different category. He's not in the, these are guys that we're really looking for. You know, you're hunting, you're pecking, try to get him in a round or two late. This is the flyer category where there's a pathway. You got to navigate it. It's not an obvious one. You're going to, you know, hamster or a rat in a maze kind of thing to get there. But you can understand the logic. Take him, sit on him, whatever. What about the other guys in that upper list? Beal and Porzingis. Those are the two big names. We've kind of saved them here for the end of the Wizards breakdown. Bradley Beal, I don't have a clue where he's going to get drafted next year because this is a guy that had through... Years of now, after this, remember he was a stress reaction guy early in his career, and then lately he's just been captain durability, just playing through everything, even on bad teams, posting huge numbers, massive usage. Scotty Brooks gone, fantasy value gone. Wizards decided to start trying to play some defense. They turned their whole operation into a slog, and Beal was not really mentally committed. I have no idea what that does to his draft stock. So it makes it really hard to try to handicap Bradley Beal when you say, all right, well, you know, what if he basically replicates last year into this year and he's a he's a fifth, sixth rounder because the steals are down and the field goal percent was lower and the turnovers were super high and the threes were lower and the usage was lower. What if? Like, there was no reason that Russell Westbrook leaving town should have led to Bradley Beal with a lower number of shots per game other than a team that decided, you know what, we don't need to take like these last 20 shots a game that we were doing last year. Let's be a middling team, but let's do it in an ugly way. That's basically what happened. And I get it. You're trying to instill new principles in the team because they're going to need to play defense at some point if they want to win any ball games. But they also did it by just being boring. That was not a fun team for most of the year. They kind of cut it loose at the end, and you know, once it was kind of too late to do anything about it. But Beal's not going to get drafted in the fifth round. This is not going to be a guy that goes from getting drafted at 12 to 60. I know he had a bad year, but he's not going to fall that far. I think there's probably an expectation that some of the stuff that was down this last year will come back a little bit. What I would use as a bit of a cautionary tale on Beal to say, I don't know that he's going to get back to where he was in the Scott Brooks Wizards year. He took 23 shots a game last season, 22.9 the year before that. He missed a ton of ball games those years, by the way. Not a ton. 15 and then 12, so that's not that bad. Remember, those were shorter years. But then 42 this season. And then all of a sudden it dropped from 23 shots a game down to 19. That's a colossal, colossal peel-off. Free throw percentage dropped by 6 and number of attempts dropped by about 33%. Went from 2.03s down to 1.6. Everything came off. Assists were back up a little bit because, you know, he didn't have Russ. But that's the only thing that got better with Russ gone. Steals were down also. Yeah, he was playing hurt for stretches, but I really think that more than anything, mentally, he wasn't engaged, and they were just playing a different kind of basketball. And unless there's some sort of massive coaching shift that takes place, I don't see why that should go back to the old way. One thing you could point to and say, okay, well, look, three years ago, Beal took about 19 and a half shots per game. Field goal percent was better. Number of those shots as three-pointers were better. He had a better percentage of his two-pointers. His steals were much higher. So maybe all of that stuff comes back, and you get 2018-2019 Bradley Beal, which wasn't bad, but that was like, you know, 20th kind of range. It was fine. It wasn't first-round level. You know, I think he was like between 15 and 20, if I'm not mistaken. Guys weren't putting up quite the same numbers even three, four years ago that they are now on a per-game basis, but 25.5 points, 2.5 threes, 5 boards, 5.5 assists, good defensive numbers, good percentages. Free throw was actually lower then, for whatever reason. Okay, maybe he gets back to something like that. 
And that would make him a pretty reasonable mid to late second round target because presumably the Wizards are going to be competing for a play-in spot. They're probably not going to fall off the map mid-season the way they did this year. And if they can get 60 good games out of Porzingis, that's a big deal. Would I draft Bradley Beal in a head-to-head league? I probably would, actually. I think he's going to play in most games this coming year. I think he's got something to prove, and I think he wants to try to win, especially if he signs the extension. Because he's like, look, this is my spot. I'm going to play when I can, and this team needs me on the floor if we're going to make a playoff push of any kind. Roto? Yeah, I think I'd probably take a look at him as well. It's going to be a bit more dependent on where he's going because I want that per-game upside, and he's not really going to have that in the way that they play basketball right now. So I actually like him a little bit better in head-to-head than Roto. I don't think they're going to be tanking. I think they're going to be pushing for for like the 8 or 9 spot. Porzingis is a different story. Porzingis is a very different story. I love Kristaps from his per-game perspective. He was drafted this year uh, in the the 50 range and obviously dramatically outperformed that on a per-game basis. He was mid-second round. He was number 17 overall on huge numbers but split between two organizations but he missed you know 35 40 percent of the season was that particularly bad for him i guess at the same time this is porzingis that's just who he is he doesn't play he really doesn't starting kind of like from his second year in the nba 66 out of 82 48 out of 82 57 out of 72, that was actually close. 43 out of 72, 51 out of 82. We're talking about a guy who misses 30 games a year regularly. So if you're drafting Porzingis, you are hoping for 60 games. Anything over that is gravy. So he probably, in my estimation, should go in about the same spot this coming year that he went last year. 50. Because he'll be a second rounder per game. And if he gets to 60 games, he beats his ADP. Actually, if he gets to like 55 games, he probably beats his ADP. If he gets to 60, he beats his ADP by about a round. If he gets to 65, he's probably a third rounder, maybe a late second already. Yeah, probably a late second. I don't think that's happening. I don't think he's playing 65 games this year. But if he does, that's where you make the argument, okay, I've drafted hyper durable. My first four picks in Roto, I've got pick 51. I'll go Porzingis, take my big shot here. And if I get a decent season, if I get 63 games out of KP, then this ends up being a really good fifth round pick. If I don't, I set myself up at least to weather that storm by having first, second, third, and fourth round picks that I'm expecting to get 70 games out of. You cannot take a shot on Porzingis in any head-to-head league, no matter what you think you've got. No, hard no, absolutely no, you cannot. Games cap Roto, you could, provided you've built in that buffer. He's the only huge risk you can take because you know he's missing a bunch of ball games. So you can't go Porzingis and then say, well, I'll take this other guy who might miss a bunch of games too because all of a sudden now you have all these things you need to fill in with your 11th, 12th round picks. Those just don't have the same odds of panning out. And that's where we're at with the Washington Wizards. Tomorrow, Friday's show, we jump up and over the New York Knicks because we already talked about them like three weeks ago. I started this, and then I abandoned ship, and now we're back into it. So if you move past the Knicks, who had 37 wins, you get to... Who was lower? Clippers! The Clippers. I thought it was going to be the Hornets, but they actually beat the Clippers by one win this year. The L.A. Clippers, that'll be an easy one, but that'll roll us into the weekend. Maybe I'll do Hornets under Mike D'Antoni because that'll be a more more fun weekend show. I'm going to flip a coin. I might go out of order just because the Clippers, I mean, that's going to be me talking for 15 minutes about how Paul George and Kawhi Leonard are only going to play 62 games and then what you do with the rest of it. But, I mean, that's content too. I don't know. In the words of the great Vin Scully, you talk about a roll of the dice. We'll roll the dice. We'll figure out what we're talking about on tomorrow's show. It's either Clippers or Hornets. Maybe I'll ask you guys. Not that it matters, because the one I don't talk about tomorrow, I'll talk about on Monday. This is 
Show 39 in the books. Dan Vespers here at Sports Ethos, bidding you a fond Thursday. Enjoy the finals tonight. Go back and listen to yesterday's show if you missed it with my buddy Mike Fiddle. We broke it all down. Get you ready for game one in Golden State. So long, everybody. Underdog Fantasy is the fastest-growing fantasy app and easiest place to play fantasy sports. Just jump on underdogfantasy.com or download the app, draft your team, and that's it. And if drafts aren't your thing, they also have a pick'em game where you can win 20 times your money in a single night. Use promo code RADIO, and Underdog will double your first deposit when you sign up with up to $100 in bonus cash. Deposit $100? Get $100 free. That's promo code RADIO. Terms and conditions apply.